When I was about 30 years old, so a few years ago now, uh, I had my very first nighttime panic attack, which really came out of the blue and about scared me to death. Before that, though, I, I probably should have seen it coming because I was, a, I was a notorious sleepwalker and had been from the time I was really little. My parents were so anxious about the fact that I was a sleepwalker that they put locks on the inside of the windows on, in my third floor bedroom because they were just sure I was going to crawl out in the middle of the night. And I probably would have if they hadn't have done that. But I tell you, the first time that I came up out of a sound sleep in the middle of one of these, these panic attacks, I knew that I had reached kind of a whole new level of, of weird, even for me. So I, I came really close that night to calling 911. And a lot of people do. They're sure they're dying. And I was pretty sure I was dying. And so as a result of that, I, I, I called the doctor and, uh, and he diagnosed me with really what amounts to a genetic panic disorder. And, uh, and, and I remembered, my, it was the same exact thing that sent my dad to the ER several times when he was younger. So the doctor prescribed me some uh, anti-anxiety medication, which helped with the nighttime panic attacks. They stopped. But unfortunately, whatever those, those drugs did to my brain also seemed to deaden a part of me that I felt like didn't need to be medicated. So... To make a long story short, I have learned to live with these night terrors or whatever, whatever they're called. And, and they're still scary when they happen, and, and they happen pretty regularly. Tammy's witnessed probably hundreds of them at this point. But occasionally, and this kind of makes it all worthwhile, occasionally instead of waking up to this feeling of impending doom, I wake up in, in, in the midst of what might best be described as a mystical experience. Uh, the Apostle Paul would have probably even called them visions. For instance, just, just this week, I, I woke up, and uh, again, instead of feeling like I was going to die, I had this intense feeling of, of God's presence, and this understanding that it was just as clear as a bell of what it means to live a life of faith. Now, I think probably some of this comes from the fact that I had just finished preaching on Hebrews, uh, we've been spending a lot of time on that, talking about faith and talking about keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus. So I think some, some of the seeds of that were already there for God to work with. But in this vision, the one message that came through loud and clear was that when we live in genuine faith, God's will is done in us and through us. Good things come into the world when we live in faith. So that's the positive side. The, the not-so-positive side, which was also as clear as a bell to me in that moment, is that living like that is really hard to do. It's not our preferred mode of operating. Uh, as we saw in Hebrews 11, for instance, the definition of faith, according to Hebrews, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. There's nothing in that definition of faith about certainty. And there's nothing in that definition of faith about security. Which it turns out is our preferred mode of being. That's what we want more than anything else. Most of the time. Which is why living a life of faith is so hard. Because we almost always default to certainty and to security. And then we wonder why God's blessings aren't flowing into our lives or into the life of our church. Many of us talk a good game when it comes to faith, but then we immediately turn around and we act as if it's entirely up to us for everything. I've heard this described before as practical atheism, which I think is a, a great phrase. In other words, I can talk about faith with my mouth, but then... I turn around and I live as if God doesn't exist at all. One place we do this a lot is with money. I think that's why Jesus talked about money so much. You can hardly open up the Gospels without finding Jesus talking about it, addressing our relationship with money, mammon, whatever you want to call it, again and again and again. 
If there's one thing the world teaches us, it's that money gives us the freedom to do and to be pretty much anything we want. Money is power. Money is something we can count on. Money gets things done. Money represents certainty and security. No doubt about it. Money is also the one place where even the best of us can get really get stuck. It can, it, it can become a barrier to, to true faith. It's like the story of the rich young man. You remember the story. He comes to him, he comes to Jesus asking him what he must do to inherit eternal life. And we know from the story that this, this kid was a boy scout. I mean, he was a he was a young man, but he was already a respected leader in his community. He followed the law, always had followed the law from the time he was a boy. But when it came to putting his faith in God and letting go of the certainty and the security that came with his wealth, he couldn't do it. Couldn't do it. It says he walked away that day grieving. Something I've noticed in my years of ministry is that pretty much everyone I've ever known who's made a real difference in the church and, and, and oftentimes in the community as well, they all have one thing in common. They tithe. Most of them give above and beyond that. And, and the, the, the thing is, is that you don't have to be rich to do that. Some of the people I know who give like that are at or below the poverty line. But they give. They tithe. Always have. It's just part of who they are. Sometimes they're, they're rich too. But money is not an issue. That's not the barrier that's, that's plaguing them. They let go of that security blanket a long time ago. And God continues to be a blessing through them. Not simply because they give, although that's part of it. But I think it's because they have chosen to live in genuine faith. I think the best, the, the best image that, that comes to, to mind for me in terms of what was re, kind of revealed to me about what living a life of faith looks like is that it's like walking on a tightrope without a net. That's what it's like. Living, living a life of faith is like that. If there's one image I would want you to take home with you today, that's, that's the one. As long as we insist on having certainty and security we're not walking by faith, period. We're not. So whatever we think we're doing for God, when we're completely in control, right, whatever we think we're doing for God, it's not going to work. It's only when we begin to operate without that safety net that God's kingdom is going to be established in us and through us. And I know that's a scary thought, but it's, I think it's absolutely critical that we understand that that is how God works. That is always how God has worked. That's another message that we see in Hebrews again and again and again. In the Old Testament, God spoke through the prophet Malachi to the people of Israel. And this is what he said. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Now, normally, we're not supposed to put God to the test. The Bible tells us that too. But in this case, God says, test away. Go ahead and try and see if the blessings don't come your way in abundance. Try it. How can you know if you don't? Some of you, I'm sure, have heard let me tell a little bit about my story because I've talked about it before. When Tammy and I first got married, or actually when we first met, I was at kind of a low point. I was, I was divorced. I was bankrupt, literally bankrupt. I was about to lose my house. So when, when Mary, Tammy and I married, we had two incomes. So that, that helped. I mean, she kind of saved my bacon in that regard. But we were still significantly underwater for a long time. A long time. In the midst of that, we decided, kind of counterintuitively really, that we were going to start giving with the goal of growing into a tithe. I mean, nothing, any accountant would have ever told us that that, that does not make sense. You can't afford to do that. 
So what we did, basically, when nothing else was working, we decided to try faith. We decided to put God to the test. And as, as Tammy will gladly confirm to anybody who wants to talk about it, from that time on, blessings have flowed and continue to flow to us and through us. I mean, all the time. It's, it's, sometimes we laugh out loud. So tithing is one way we can begin to walk in faith. It's a really pretty simple way that you can do this, that you can try it if you're not already doing it. You can do it. But it's certainly not the only one. In our scripture reading for today from 1 Peter 4, the Apostle Paul has some suggestions about what a life of faith looks like. Even when the world as we know it might be coming to an end. That's where he begins. So take a look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7-11. through 11. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be serious and disciplined and discipline yourself for the sake of your prayers. Above all, maintain constant love for one another, for love covers a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without complaining. Like good stewards of the manifold grace of God, serve one another with whatever gift each of you has received. Whoever speaks must do so as one speaking the very words of God. Whoever serves must do so with the strength that God supplies, so that God may be glorified in all things through Jesus Christ. To him belongs the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Now, we chose this particular text about a year ago because we were thinking this Sunday might be a good time for us to think a little bit about stewardship. We, we need to stop and do that occasionally. And as you may have noticed, Peter talks about being stewards of the manifold grace of God. So what is a steward? A steward is someone who is responsible for taking care of somebody else's property. A good steward is one who is faithful in seeing to his master's business, even if the master isn't around. So good stewardship isn't just about how we manage our money and property, although that's, that's certainly a part of it. And, uh, and of course, nothing, everything that we have really is borrowed. We don't take anything with us. So we are called to be good stewards, good managers of it. But it's also about how we manage everything God has given to us. Not just our money and our property. Even the simplest and most mundane things can be done for the glory of God. Should be done for the glory of God. Now you'd think that after announcing that the world as we know it is coming to an end, Peter would have had something really big for the church to do. You'd think he would have said, you know, go to a foreign country and preach the gospel, or go be a martyr, or sell everything you have and give it to the poor. And there were people who did that, certainly who did that in the early church. But the four things that Peter suggests in his list are things that anyone can do. And all of us in the body of Christ should be doing. So let's, let's take a look at those, that, that short list here again. First of all, he says, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. In other words, don't get drunk. And there's lots of different ways that we get drunk. We can get drunk on alcohol or other drugs, but we can also get drunk on ambition. We can get drunk on political ideology. You know, we can get basically anything that makes us crazy. Okay, you got to let that stuff go. Because that's not serious, that's not sober-minded, that's going to get in the way of your, your, your faith and your, your, your prayer life and everything else. Let that stuff go. Be serious-minded, be sober. Number two, maintain constant love for one another. Because when we do that, when there's an atmosphere of love, we can overlook the little things. Because we're going we're gonna to hurt each other. Through our words, through our actions, it's going to happen. That's what happens in community. That's what happens in relationships. But when there's an atmosphere of love, we can overlook those things. Little things, even big things. When love is not present, we're going to be offended by everything. Love one another. Maintain that love for one another. Thirdly, show hospitality without grumbling. In other words, we, we have to especially in the church, we need to, we need to be as, as open as we can to those who don't know Jesus, who may be really different from ourselves. 
We've got to make this a place that's welcoming to everyone, even people that might be a little different than us, and do it without grumbling, right? That isn't the way I like it. No, do it without grumbling. And finally, use what God has given you to humbly serve one another. In other words, be stewards of the resources, be stewards of the talents, be stewards of all of the spiritual gifts God has given you so that you can serve one another in the local church. That, that last part, I think, is important. I want, to, I want to emphasize that because that's what Peter was getting at. That's what Paul was getting at whenever he talks about spiritual gifts too. Sometimes we forget that letters like 1 Peter and almost all of Paul's letters, they were written to early to, to, to churches, right? And they were read out loud in their worship services. That's how they figured out who they were, what they were supposed to do, how they were supposed to be in the world. So what Peter was telling those churches is that even the simplest things we do in the church like offering hospitality to strangers and loving and forgiving each other, those things have cosmic consequences. They matter big time. Little things matter big time. When we love and serve faithfully in this way, God's kingdom is made manifest. And it becomes closer to being fulfilled completely until someday, as, as Peter says, all things will be glorified in Jesus Christ. That's where things are headed. You might say that the church holds stores of potential. Glory, grace, love. That are just waiting to be released. Just, be, just waiting to be tapped into. In the same way geologists tell us, there are still trillions of barrels of oil. You know, under the, under the earth, waiting to be tapped. God sees our potential in the same way. If just a few faithful people walking on a tightrope without a net can change the world, which is exactly what the apostles did, imagine what a whole community of believers living in faith can do. Imagine what we can do here in Keokuk and in the tri-state area if we live that way. For whatever reason, the world has convinced us that the only things that really matter are big and loud and easy to see. But that is not how God works. We've got to get past that. When Jesus drew the attention of the disciples to the poor widow, we all know that story. Look, think about that story a little, deep, a little more deeply. She says she put in everything she had. She didn't even hold back. I mean, it was only, what, two cents probably the smallest gift given that day, but she, she didn't even save enough back to, to eat that day or the next day. She put everything she in, everything she had, she put in. When he pointed her out, he wasn't pointing to the size of her gift, he was pointing to the boldness of her faith. She might have been the only person in the temple that day that was willing to leave certainty and security behind and truly walk in faith. And Jesus saw that and he lifted her up as an example for the rest of us. That's what that story is about. As Peter said at the beginning of our reading today, the end is coming. Someday everything that brings us certainty and security in this world will be gone. There's no question about it. It will. It's only those things that are born of faith and love that will continue. So let us walk in genuine faith loving and serving in all the simple ways that are available to us because that's how God's kingdom comes on earth, even as it is in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, you have called us to live a life of faith, to, to, to boldly walk in this world, trusting that you are in charge, that you have a plan, and, and we know that when we walk in faith, we can be a part of that plan. We can see it opening and, and blossoming all around us when we walk in faith, but we also confess that we, we desire certainty and security. We want that more than anything often. Help us to trust you. Help us to walk on that 
tightrope without a net. Help us to live in faith, even as your son showed us, who was the pioneer and perfecter of that faith. Help us to look to him in all things, that we might live faithfully in this world. For we ask it all in his name.